Hi everyone, it's so good to be here with you as we continue exploring the icons of our faith. My name is Lucas Prado, I'm the Pickering site pastor, and by the way, if you're from Pickering or west of Pickering, I miss each one of you and I can't wait for all of us to be together again. But as we're here exploring the icons of our faith, I'm so excited to share with you one more icon. So far we've discussed about the fish, the anchor, the lamb, the cross. And it's been so good how God has invited us to be shaped and transformed by Him as we reflect on these icons. And before we go on like with one more symbol this week, can I ask you a question before that? What have you been exploring lately in your own life? If you think about yourself and reflect for a moment the stage that you're in right now, what have you been like intentionally searching for, digging deeper, investigating carefully in you? Do you know the definition of exploring? Exploring is travel in or through an unfamiliar country or area in order to learn about or familiarize oneself with it. So the whole idea of exploring is well connected with travel. And although we haven't been able to go anywhere, guess what? The trips of our imagination and our inner journey finds no limits by our current physical stage. So again, let me ask you, what have you been exploring lately in your life? What's been on your minds, your hearts, your soul? One says that exploration is curiosity put into action. And as the Apostle Paul has said before, in Christ, in Jesus Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So let me begin by saying that exploring the icons of our faith is most of all an invitation from God to you and me, to all of us, to explore, to go deeper, and finds the hidden treasures that God has for you and me. Hidden treasures of who He is and who we are in Him. So, as we start here right now, can we simply pause for a second and ask God to simply allow us to explore deeper, but not simply have any information here, but be formed by Him. Right now, like, join me in prayer. Can you close your eyes for a second? God, thank you so much for this time. And I ask you, Holy Spirit of God, as you're here right now with each one of us, and as we're going to explore one more symbol, one more icon of our faith, our Christian faith, we want most of all, God, we want to find you alone. We don't want to simply be informed, but we want to be transformed by your presence. So as you're here speaking with us, wherever we are, whenever we're watching this, you are able to speak to us. So speak to us, God, and transform our lives here. In Jesus' name I pray to you. Amen. Today we'll talk about the dove. Yes, doves, sensitive birds in different colors and famously known in white. They're all used in many settings as symbols of love, peace, and also messengers. They often appear in political cartoons, on banners, and sites at events promoting peace, such as the Olympic, Olympic Games that we're just watching right now. And if you're familiar with the great artist Pablo Picasso, one of his famous paintings it is called La Colombe. The dove. And this painting, it is so interesting because he painted that in 1949 and he painted on a piece of napkin in a restaurant. And actually, his painting became so famous that actually in 1949 it became the icon for the World Peace Council. But is the dove primarily a symbol of peace? Is that it? We'll see how even this idea comes from the Bible, but it is far deeper than that. Of all the ancient Mediterranean symbols of the Christian church adopted, the dove was extremely popular in the arts, de depicted on objects like vessels, lamps, catacomb walls, tombs, buildings. And why is that? Well, it all begins in the book of Genesis. Genesis 1-2 says, Now the earth was formless and empty, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In the Jewish commentaries on the book of Genesis called Talmud, as well as the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is an additional reference here to this second verse in the Bible. And the reference is, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, like a dove which hovers over her young without touching them. So we see the second verse in the Bible already has a mention about the symbol. And a bit further in Genesis, after Adam and Eve, we all know the story of Noah and the ark. The dove strikes again right here. Wickedness all over, the, all over the earth, corruption, sin, human violence. But then God comes to Noah and gives him a mission. 
He builds an ark. He brings all his family to the ark as well with a pair of each animal, including doves. And the whole society laughs at first at Noah. Remember the movie Avon Almighty? Well, the flood came for 40 days. It destroys every single thing. And for 150 days, the waters covered the whole earth. But Genesis 8, 1 says that God remembered Noah and the waters receded. And after several days, Noah, he tested the waters to see if there was dry lands. And what he did? As a sailor, he knew all the nautical strategies of his days. And one of them was using doves or other birds as actually a, a way to help sailors find or navigate the waters. So this is what he does. He takes the dove and sends the dove three times. The first time, no success at all. The second time, the dove goes but comes back with a freshly plucked olive leaf in its beak. So he knew, wow, there is a dry land. And the third time, the dove goes and never returns. So here we see that actually Noah knows now it is a safe time to seek for dry lands. And this whole story became the fundamental for both how Jews and Christians, they understood the promise of God for a new creation. And the olive branch became the symbol of peace and the dove a herald of peace. Now we understand why, like even the idea of, of, uh, of the symbol of peace of the dove from Pablo Picasso's painting. But see, the same Spirit of God hovering over the waters, like a dove, now here is portraying the new life, the fulfillment of a new life, a new creation that is available in God. And this new life can only be brought by the one who is the herald of peace, the carrier of peace, the prince of peace. A bit later in the book of Leviticus, we see again the dove following the story of the people of Israel. In the Mosaic Law, we see the doves, they were used as a sin offering because they were a symbol of purity, but also because they were accessible. What, is, what does it mean? It means that the doves, they were used by those who could not afford the most expensive offerings, such as the spotless lamb, like we have discussed two weeks ago. So here we see God's universal provision for everyone, regardless of their economic or social status. That's why even Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, after Jesus he was born, remember that he, they brought to the temple Jesus Christ and there they offered a sin offering. And what was the sin offering? It was the dove. So see, like here, like we see that uh, Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, they, they were coming from a humble family. And, and, and this notion of God's provision for everyone that is so relevant because later on, like now Jesus is not a baby anymore, but a grown-up man, already in his ministry. Remember that time when Jesus, he goes to the temple and he gets so mad at all the merchants there, including the ones selling doves there. And he drove all of them out of the temple. And why he did this? Because he was so furious that all these merchants, they have turned what was good for evil. They were taking advantage of the poor and overcharging them for all the ritual sacrifices. So see, the dove is well connected here with purity, holiness, but also simplicity. And still in the Old Testament, the image of the dove keeps showing up in several ways through the prophets, psalms, and even poetic books. Prophet Isaiah, he gives us a wonderful understanding, a new insight of the symbol, the dove. Isaiah 59 says, like the blinds, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. We all growl like bears. We moan mournfully like doves. We look for justice, but find none. Deliverance, but it is far away. For our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities. See this low, cooing sound of the dove shows the grieving of someone's life over sin. The doves, the doves, they mourn just as we people we mourn because we all know that in this world, we will have trouble. And the dove represents the people mourning over sin, but also as the Spirit of God. It's so beautiful because it shows the gentle and profound way that God's heart is broken by sin. How sin in itself grieves the Holy Spirit of God. As the Apostle Paul has said in Romans 8, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. 
And we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. As Pastor Jonah has said before to all of us, the Holy Spirit groans on our behalf because like the Son of God, the Spirit has taken the problem, the problem of evil upon himself voluntarily by dwelling within his children. And he dwells in us. And because of the sin in the world and also the sin in our own flesh, he groans. It is not like he knows that this is not God's will for our lives. So we see here the importance of the dove as a symbol to the Jewish community in several ways in the Old Testament. The Spirit of God hovering over the waters. It's a sign from God to Noah, a herald of peace. It's an atoning sacrifice, but also it represents God's own mourning over sin. But see, there is one missing element when we just like go through the sign of the dove in the Old Testament. Actually, as a matter of fact, there is a whole book in the Bible that the whole Jewish community they know so well, and as well ourselves Christians, that this book is called Dove. What? A book in the Bible that is called Dove? Yes. And as a matter of fact, ourselves, Sanctus Church, we have gone through a whole series with this book last year, 2020, before we all got hit by the pandemic. Do you remember that? Can you recall what book was that? It is the book of Jonah. I don't know if you remember this, but Pastor John, he taught us that actually the meaning for the name Jonah is Dove. And there in the book of Jonah, we, we actually can explore and understand like better about the meaning of this, of this symbol. We could see how Jonah, the dove, he is called by God, but he runs away from God. But he cannot outrun God's grace, God's mercy and love, both for him and also for the mission that he wants to accomplish through Jonah's life. See, Jonah, the dove, he is called by God. He's selected by God to bring the good news to the people of Nineveh. But Jonah, the dove, stubbornly, he refused and he runs away from God's calling. But even with all of his mistakes, the Spirit of God, the dove hovering over the waters, the dove that brings a new beginning, a new life, was inviting him and drawing him near to him to have forgiveness for himself, for repentance, and also to bring this not simply for himself, but for the people of Nineveh. A wild mission, a transformative, loving mission that God had for him and also for the people of Nineveh. So see, like he... When we reflect about this symbol, it is so, so important because this symbol represents who God is, but also how God he invites us to be parts in his own mission. And for the whole Jewish community, they all knew about that. Like when they would look to the past, to the Old Testament, all their readings, they understood that this was a powerful symbol to all of them. But it's right here in the New Testament that we see the combination of all of its meanings. We see the fulfillment, the full manifestation, a heavenly, majestic manifestation of this symbol in the life of Jesus Christ and at his baptism. As a matter of fact, like these events, it is recorded in all four Gospels, not only one, but all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you remember, like Jesus is there in the Jordan River, and he's being now baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. And right there, this is what the gospel Luke says, Luke chapter 3 says, And as Jesus was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Come on, can you take a moment for a second and simply reflect on the relevance of this passage? This is one of the most beautiful descriptions of the Trinity. God's Son, Jesus Christ, now beginning His ministry and fulfilling the promise of a new life through His own baptism. Heavens open wide and God Father now like out loud, just like declaring His full approval, love, love and also redemptive, redemptive mission that He had through His Son, Jesus Christ. And He was saying, you are my Son, my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. And not simply that, but also God's Spirit descending from heaven, only Him, Jesus Christ, in a bodily form like a dove, now equipping, empowering, inspiring Jesus Christ. In all of this, this is the combination of a beautiful like alliance with all of them. Why? Because they're God, three person, one. 
It is the beautiful like vision of our Trinity and how actually God he invites us to understand that the same unity that there is like with God, the three persons, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, He also invites us to have the same unity with ourselves, brothers and sisters. See, like, uh, the dove is so beautiful because it brings this beautiful meaning to our lives. But you might ask, but, but why the dove? Why, why such using a, 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 a fragile, a, a gentle creature? Well, like, as we have seen through this whole uh, series, it's not about the symbol, but it's about the encounter with the one that, had, that gives us the symbol, the creator of the symbol. So, why the dove? It's simple, because the dove represents who God is. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, the great I Am, the God who created the whole universe, the sovereign one, and yet He is gentle, He is the servant one, He's the Prince of Peace, He is the promise of a new life, He is available to all of us, He is the pure sacrifice to our lives. And He also, through all of this, He reveals not simply who He is, but also who we are in Him. And now here we see, even with Jesus Christ's life, as He is empowered by the Holy Spirit, now also Jesus Christ, later on in His ministry, He says, no, it's not about simply receiving the dove, but I call each one of you, my disciples, to also be like doves. A bit later, like in Jesus' ministry, Matthew chapter 10, there's this wonderful passage that Jesus comes to His disciples and He tells them, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Whoa, Jesus, really? Like, you're sending us all to that like, way? Yes, but, but watch out. Therefore, I want you all to be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. And what does, he, what does he mean about that? Do not worry about what you say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what you say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father is speaking through you. See, God's Spirit revealed to us as a dove, now He calls us all to be like doves. And what does it mean? He calls us all now to be empowered by Him, to be filled by His presence, and now to reflect who He is to the world. This is a wonderful like calling to you and me. That's why this, this is so mind-blowing, this is so majestic. There's so much in the symbol because it is, a, it is an invitation from God to you and me to now be filled by Him and also now to act like Him to live like Him in this world. But as we just like go through all of this, Old Testament, New Testament, what does it mean to us as a whole church? How should we apply this to our own lives? And let me go through like a few things that I believe God is speaking to all of us now here this season. First of all, let me tell you, the first thing that we gotta do, we need to acknowledge the dove. We need to accept the Holy Spirit of God. And who is He? He's our everything. His God Spirit available to all who call on His name. And as a matter of fact, you cannot know God's Father or even God's Son, Jesus Christ, if not by God Spirit. He is the only source. We talk to God's Father in the name of God the Son, Jesus Christ, only by the power and authority of God Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And He's our everything. He's been present since the beginning of the whole creation, hovering over the waters, like a dove, a herald of peace to Noah, showing clearly that a new life has just become. He is the atoning sacrifice, showing that there is a way and a call to holiness to all of us. He is cooing, groaning on our behalf because of the sin in the world and in our own flesh. He descended on Jesus, and as He was baptized, He filled Him with His presence. And not simply that, like, but now Jesus Christ, He was only able to fulfill His mission, only able to fulfill His mission because He was filled by the Holy Spirit of God in His life. And this is not, it, it doesn't end with Jesus Christ, quite the opposite. No, Jesus Christ, God's Father, and actually God's Son, Jesus Christ, both of them promised to you, you and me, to all the disciples. Acts 1 says what? Do not leave Jerusalem, Jesus said to his disciples, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water, yes, but in a few days you will be, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. See, God Father promised the best gift ever. God's spirits came all over the ones there in the upper room and filled them, and they were never the same again. 
And for 2,000 years, God's Spirit still like moves in beautiful way. He never ceases to amaze us, surprise us with His power, His glory, His miracles. He's so wonderful. He's so powerful. And He's right here right now available to each one of us. Come on, if you're a Christian, He already dwells in you. Do you realize this? And if you're not a Christian, He invites you. He, he wants to fill you up as well when everything starts with God's Son, Jesus Christ. Romans 10 says what? If you declare with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised Him from the dead, guess what? You will be saved. And as part of your salvation, the best gifts ever, God's Spirit, will dwell in you. And the life you've always wanted, the best life ever, the abundant life that is available in God will come to you and God is going to fill you more and more as you say, God, I want, I desire you in my life. So everything starts when we acknowledge the dove. We accept the Holy Spirit of God. But let me tell you, we're not supposed to stop there. We, we've got to go further. As we accept the Holy Spirit, so we need to welcome the dove. We need to embrace the Holy Spirit of God. And what do we mean about that? The best way for us to embrace Him, it is to first of all confess who we are without Him. Confess how lost we are without God. Confess like how lost, like open up our hearts and say how like through this whole season sometimes if we don't have you in our lives, God, we have nothing. And can I be honest, can I be honest with you? During this whole season that we're all living in, like how many times you and me, we have neglected the Holy Spirit of God, whether intentionally or unintentionally? Especially for us Christians, although He dwells in us and He wants to shape, transform, guide our lives, keep, keep growing ourselves in Him, how many times we just like put Him on the side and we simply neglect Him? I wonder like how much we have been grieving the Holy Spirit because we are not aligned with the Holy Spirit of God. See, like in all of this that we're all facing right now, like it is so easy for us to, to look and, and focus on our own opinion, our own ways, our worldview, our fears, discontentment of whatever like we're just facing right now, and our own human theories of what's happening in the world and how it can all be fixed. But can, can you and me simply shut ourselves down for a second and say, God, you know what? Like I'm done with my own thoughts. I don't want to simply follow my own plans. I don't want to be like Jonah, the dove, like trying to now go and conquer like whatever I want you by my own decisions. But no, I come and want to quiet myself and want to say, God, I depend on you. I confess that I need you so much in my life. And this is what God is calling us to, all to. I, I wonder like how much we're grieving Him because actually we're more focused on ourselves. And see like uh, the Holy Spirit of God, He grieves. Not only because of the sin in the world, but it, everything starts here in our own hearts. By our transgressions, by our corruption, by the division of our words and actions. How much have we brought like division to the world now with our own words and actions? See, Ephesians chapter 4 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. Let me pause here and ask, with your words and your actions, are you building up others? It's been like more words that flows from the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, or more you now, now with your own minds, now with your own reasoning, reasoning, trying now to do whatever you want to. See, like we gotta give space to the Holy Spirit, and, and I believe that we grieve the Holy Spirit as we don't give space to His presence. So again, everything starts when we simply come and we confess. We pause ourselves and say, God, oh, we're done. We need you so much in our lives. And guess what? It is the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of holiness. And also God calls us to have a life of holiness. As a matter of fact, for all of us that we call Sanctus Home, this is how God calls us. Our identity, the name of our church and the identity that God has given us comes from these words, holy. Why? Because it reflects who God is, but also who we are in Him. It's how He calls us and how He calls us to become. And guess what? We're only going to become what He calls us to become if we embrace what He wants us to embrace. If we desire what He desires, and it is holiness. We need to desire holiness right now in our lives. Do you want to see a great revival in our midst? 
Everything starts when you and me say, you know what, God, I want to come here, I want to humble myself, and I need you so much. I confess that I'm nothing, I'm done without you. See, Second Chronicles 7 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their lands. It is time to confess, church. It's time for all of us to come to God and say, God, you know what? Like, I don't want to fake holiness. No, I want to go deeper. And I want to see you now growing in me, not my own desires, but your will in my life, God, your fruits. And what does the Bible say? That the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Come on, do you see His fruits taking place in your life? Do you see His fruit growing flourishing, changing, transforming you, and also using you because you're giving more and more space to Him in your own life? Or are we suppressing the Holy Spirit of God? See, it's a call to all of us to accept the Holy Spirit, but also to embrace Him, to welcome Him and say, God, we confess we need you so much in our lives. Change us all. But lastly, we cannot simply accept Him, acknowledge Him, and embrace Him. But a way for us to embrace Him is when we desire Him. Like when we're thirsty and we grab like a, a glass of water and we know that our whole body craves for that, desires that so much. The same it is with the Holy Spirit of God. Like as we're here in a dry land, facing all the problems that we're facing, we need to desire the Holy Spirit of God. Let me ask you, what do you desire most in your life? What are your biggest desires? Let me tell you, there's nothing wrong seeking and pursuing your own desires and caring for yourself. But everything is wrong when you're only and primarily seeking and pursuing your own desires and caring for yourself. No, there is an abundant life and there's only one that is able to give it to us. Jesus said, John 10, 10, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. A bit later in chapter 7, Gospel of John, he gives us the meaning for this full life. He says, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me, come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And when he said living water, he was speaking of the spirits, the Spirit of God, who would be given to everyone believing in him. Come on, do you believe in God? Are you thirsty? Rivers of living water is available to all of us, and He wants to fill us up with His presence. He wants to all of us to experience Him in a way that we have never experienced before. Or actually, we have experienced before, but now like the way that He's going to do it, it'll be in a new, refreshing way where more and more of His presence it is available to all of us. It's not something about the past. It is not simply like an occasion over there, but right here, right now, it is a call for all of us for His holy people to be holy as He is holy, to desire Him, and everything starts when we simply say, God, I desire you, and I open myself to you alone. That's a beautiful invitation. And guess what? Like This is not my word saying here, but this is a prophetic promise of God to you and me. The prophet Joel, he said, It will come about after this, that I'll pour out my spirits on all mankind. And your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men and women will dream dreams, your young men and women will see visions, even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirits in those days. And guess what? Since, it, since the Pentecost, He has already come to all of us and He's available to each one of us. And there's nothing, nothing better than saying, God, you know what? Like, I desire you. Come on, church, and now it is a time for all of us to go deeper with God, to say, God, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to simply like live my life in a shallow way. I want to go deeper with you. I want to experience you in my life, God. I want to understand this table, but not simply to have an information. But most of all, I want to desire you most of all in my life, more than anything else. I want your presence. And guess what? He's inviting us because he wants to pour out his presence in all of us. But everything starts when we desire Him and say, God, here we are. We open ourselves to You. Pastor John has said before that revival requires repentance. And genuine repentance requires change. So we got to change our ways and we got to look for Him. Let me say, for, for all of us that call Santa's home, for our 
kids, youth, young adults. Let me tell you, now it is a call for an abundant life that is available in God. And only He is able to give it to us. So right now, like we got to be intentional and say, God, we desire you. And in a beautiful way, He's going to fuel us up. He's going to give us His fruits. We're going to see like more and more Himself like in us. And not simply that, but also He's going to give us His gifts to all of us, kids, youth, young adults, all of us, like He wants to fill us up. He wants to express Himself to our whole church in a way that we have never experienced before, but it always starts when we say yes to Him. And also for all the young families, for the adults, for seniors, let, let me give a word to all of us. It is so, so, so easy for us sometimes to look at the past and say, you know what, like, yes, I experienced this over a mission trip, over like a youth, uh, youth group, over like my time over there in the young adults, whatever it is. Like, it is so, so easy for us sometimes to look at the past and say, those are the glorious days. But guess what? The Holy Spirit is available to all of us and He calls us now in the new season that we're in, in the season that we're in now that we are parents, that we have all our, all our responsibilities, our duties, all the stuff that we do. He wants to fill us up in a way that He has never filled before. He wants to use us. And again, this is not my words. This is the prophetic word from God to you and me that your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men and women will dream dreams, your young men and women, they will see visions. What category are you in right now? What's your age? Let me tell you, your age is not a limitation to God. God, He wants to use us and fill us in a powerful way. And everything starts when we say yes to Him. God, we want to be filled by Him. Come on, Saint Church. Come on, all of us. Like, wherever you are, wherever you're watching this message right now, the Holy Spirit's right there with you, and He wants to fill you. And every single thing, like, it starts when you simply accept Him. When you embrace Him, and you say like, God, I want to have my desire in you alone. Recently, one of our pastors received a prophetic words to our church. And it's such a beautiful word that has been heard and tested in community by our leaders. But this is a beautiful invitation to all of us. And I want to read this word here. But as I read, like, I would like you just to simply pause for a second. And say, God, I, I don't want to simply like hear this from one ear to the other and that's it, move on with my life. But as you're right here, God, I want to hear these words and I want to be changed by them. This is what the Word of God says. I'm present with you. My spirit is closed. I dwell in this building. I dwell in your hearts. I dwell within the hearts of the people who call Sanctus home. And I'm approaching this nation to spark a revival to make my name known across the globe. Many will come to love me. Many will know my glory. And I'll bring healing and freedom and peace, purity. Pray for the weak to be strong. Pray for those who are weary. Give them hope and strength. My mighty righteousness approaches. And this is not a task nor a drill. The flood waters are rising. It will soon crash down. My spirit will be poured out on the people of Durham. Those who have not heard my name will know me. Those who want nothing to do with me will love me. Those who hate me will adore me. All will come to worship me. All will bring praise to my name. For the salvation of the lost is the most important to me. I gave it all so that I can be with him. I have gone to the cross to redeem each of you in our relationship together. Oh, how long for my people to spend time with me. Oh, how long for my people to draw near to me. We distract ourselves with so many things, yet I'm the only one that can fill people's needs. I am the only one. Well, they will find what they're looking for. Those who are running will stop. Those who are hiding will come out. Those who have turned their backs will turn around. And I'll mend the brokenness. I will heal the pain. I will spark joy. And I'll bring revival to the people of Durham and beyond. See, this is a beautiful invitation to you and me. And we, we got to say yes to Him. We got to be open up ourselves, humble ourselves. Now is not a time to stand up, but now through the whole crisis that, we're, that our country is facing, through so many different things that we're all like seeing right now, like it is a time for us to simply humble ourselves, bow down and say, God, I desire you. And it starts here in our own hearts. Revival starts here, God, in my own hearts. Renew my life, God. Change me completely. 
wherever you are. Can you, can you close your eyes for a second? By the way, if you're not a Christian right now, God is inviting you. And if you desire this so much in your life, we would love to pray for you. But it's simple. As we have said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts, you will be saved. So right now, simply pray that with your own words. But also, if you're online right now, we would love to pray with you with our prayer team. If you're watching this later on, like, please connect with our church and we would love to pray for you. We would love to help you out in this journey. But for all of us Christians, can you close your eyes for a second? And just like ask God, please God, we desire you. God, thank you so much because here you are speaking to us and you're inviting us for more of you, God. We desire your presence so much. And we ask you, please God, we open up ourselves, we accept you, we embrace you, we confess that we're nothing without you. We want to be holy as you are holy, God. We want to see your fruits, not ours, not our own will, but your fruits, the fruit of the Spirit taking place in our own lives, God. And we want to be used by you. We want to desire you, God, so you can empower us, fill us up with your presence. And now all of us filled with your presence, we can go out there in the world and we can witness that there is a higher love. There is a higher way of living. There is only the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, and you are Jesus Christ. So thank you, God. Thank you for all that you're doing in our midst. And right now, God, please empower all of us to seek you first. And to welcome you, Holy Spirit, to have the, the whole direction, guidance of our lives. Thank you so much because here you are with us and you're speaking to us, God. And we want to be changed by you. And this is simply the beginning of great things that we have in store for all of us. In Jesus Christ, I pray to you, God. Amen. May God bless you very much. Mm -hmm.